Uh, on behalf of uh, Dr. Melanie Ott, the director of the Gladstone Institute of Virology and Immunology, and myself, my name is Warner Green. I direct the Center for HIV Cure Research. It's a pleasure to welcome you this to this second live streaming event from Gladstone, focusing on COVID-19 and this year and the holidays such as they are. Um, so I would like to begin with just an overview of, uh, to share with you. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome you. And I thought I would begin with an overview of where we stand in the global COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, we're now in the midst of a second, more lethal wave of infections. Um, Hotspots around the, the, the world include the United States for sure, places in, uh, in Europe, Serbia, Georgia, Lithuania, Sweden, Sweden, which tried uh, to establish herd immunity that was a failed experiment there, and they now are, are seeing very high infection rates. Um, of interest, uh, the second wave of the 1918 Spanish flu uh, also was the most lethal uh, in, during that pandemic. Um, COVID-19 infections right now are at 69.5 million worldwide with 1.6 million uh, deaths. The uh, state of the, the COVID pandemic in the United States is unfortunately, we lead the world in total infections and deaths. There are now more COVID-19 deaths uh, uh, have occurred than all of the uh, individuals who died during World War II. Essentially, we're experiencing a near 9-11 event uh, every day. Viral infections are increasing in an exponential uh, manner throughout the United States. Healthcare systems are currently on the brink and an intensifying surge is on its way. It's hard to overstate the threat that our country faces uh, with this expanding uh, pandemic. What about California? Well, California is no different. We are on red alert. Infections here are up 90%. Deaths are up 99%. Hospitalizations up 77%. And we're experiencing over 300,000 new infections a day. Now, in general, we've started from a, from a lower baseline, particularly here in the Bay Area, as I'll mention in a moment. But virus is surging throughout California, 67 new cases per day per 100,000 population. Compare that to other hotspots, Rhode Island, 115 new cases per day per 100,000, Indiana, 97, Alaska, 93, and uh, uh, enviably, Hawaii, 6.5 new cases per day per 100,000. Uh, these numbers in terms of the, the California compared to the United States, which is at 63 new cases per day, France, 17, Germany, 23, Sweden, 54, and then the Asian countries who have really have fought back and, and have really controlled this pandemic, South Korea at 1.4, Australia less than one, China less than one, New Zealand less than one. That said, virus is breaking out again in, in, in Asia, in South Korea, Japan, and, and even China. And so they are implementing new control measures. So where are the infections hitting the hardest here in California? Well, uh, initially it was Imperial County that was the, the focal point. Uh, and then the virus moved up the Central Valley. Uh, LA got hit hard. Uh, one in 21 people uh, living in LA County have been, become infected and that's a minimal estimate. Uh, Imperial County, it's one in 10. Kern County, it's one in 18. Here in the Bay Area, we, are, we have less virus uh, in, in the Bay Area. For example, Marin, one in 31 infected. San Francisco, one in 50, San Mateo, one in 45, Contra Costa, one in 40, Santa Clara, one in 44. So you, you get an idea that we have less virus in the Bay Area, but we're not all that different uh, from LA, for example, maybe a twofold less uh, virus in our community. So what if we had mirrored the actions taken early in the pandemic by South Korea? What if we'd worn masks uniformly, we'd socially distanced, we'd had appropriate hand hygiene, but most importantly, if we'd have done abundant testing and contact tracing to isolate and quarantine anyone who was uh, infected? Well, uh, the situation would have been far different. Our economy would not have uh, been shut down. Our schools would have stayed open. And even adjusting for the population difference, we would have had, uh, we would have only lost 3,600 people to COVID-19 instead of 292,000. South Korea's GDP is the second lowest drop in the world as well. 
uh, behind China at, at minus 1%. Uh, Compare that to the EU at minus 8% and the US at minus 4%. So controlling the virus has definite economic uh, benefit. Still, we have no national testing and tracing strategy here in the United States. Our schools are general, generally closed. Our economy is suffering. We have massive unemployment. One in four children are food insecure. The picture on the right is a drone photo of cars lined up for food. Uh, these are essentially bread lines uh, in Florida. Congress can't seem to agree upon a second stimulus package. And masking, which is so important to control the transmission of this virus from asymptomatic individuals who don't know that they are infected, has become highly politicized. Um, and, and it's really unfortunate because that's helping fuel uh, the pandemic. But there is light at the end of this very dark tunnel, promising vaccines. Just yesterday, the FDA Advisory Committee recommended emergency use authorization approval for Pfizer and BioNTech's RNA vaccine, which has been shown to be 94 to 95% effective in a large phase three clinical trial. Moderna's RNA vaccine comes up for review next week. It similarly is showing a 94 to 95% effectiveness. AstraZeneca is trailing in third place. Um, they have reported just uh, uh, recently in Lancet uh, the results of their vaccine, 70.4% effective. However, if individuals were given a low, like a half dose and then a full dose boost, the vaccine apparently jumped up to 90% effectiveness although certainly far greater numbers of individuals, that needs to be proven in a, in a more robust uh, way. AstraZeneca is presently weighing options about how to deploy their vaccine. Uh, there is a suggestion in their data that it might protect against asymptomatic infection. Uh, they are currently in discussions with Russia to combine their vac vaccine with Russia's Sputnik uh, V to, to create a dual vaccine that might have higher effectiveness. On deck is the Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine. They may release their trial data in, in late December. Uh, some bad news on the vaccine front though. Sanofi GSK, GSK found that the immunogenicity of their vaccine in older adults was disappointing. Uh, probably the dose selected was uh, too low, but there doesn't seem to be a, an easy course forward uh, for their vaccine uh, at present. So, those were the, the kind of the updates I wanted to share uh, with you. I will, uh, what I'll do next is I uh, introduce Melanie Ott, who will talk about testing and uh, activities at Gladstone. Melanie, as I mentioned, directs the Gladstone Institute of uh, uh, Virology. It's a pleasure to introduce her now. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you, Warner, um, for this um, great overview. I hope my uh, slide is visible in the correct way. It is. Good. Okay, thank you. Yes, I, I want to add a few thoughts uh, after this very important overview from Warner um, to, um, to, to give you a little bit of a Gladstone pr uh, perspective because listening to all these um, bad news and numbers, uh, it feels certainly like a Groundhog Day meets Armageddon currently. A Groundhog Day because of a rewind of another shutdown that we are in now, um, similar to March, where we only have um, testing, social distancing, and masking at hand to protect us. Um, the question is really whether we have to meet Armageddon this uh, holiday season, and that's what um, this town hall is about. Um, there has been a lot of, uh, I, would, I would argue here in this few minutes that um, there is um, not a total Groundhog Day here today, but that there has been um, quite some progress been made since March to today. Most importantly, as Warner mentioned, um, the authorization or the expected authorization of the Pfizer vaccine tonight, um, which of course is a major step forward with all the other vaccines following um, in line. But also, um, um, I want to, step to take a step back and look what we have done here at Gladstone in order to respond to this, um, you know, um, catastrophic pa pandemic. Um, I think most importantly, we have 
really geared up um, and built a BSL-3 high containment laboratory so that we are able to really get our hands onto the virus and meaningfully contribute to um, viral research. Um, and while our initial work has been performed at, 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 at Parnassus, um, we have now built our own brand new uh, beautiful BSL-3 facility on the sixth floor where we do both cell culture and animal work, uh, or we will start animal work shortly. This has really allowed us now to um, contribute um, to, um, to investigations of the viral life cycle in more detail. And, and more than 12 investigators here at Gladstone have pivoted part of their research program to the studies of SARS-CoV-2. And with this at hand, we have now much better insight into how the virus gets into the cell, how the virus is hijacking um, our own resources for its own, um, for its own um, replication. We have built some um, defective viral particles that can work as a prevention. Uh, we know much more about the immune response that the virus elicits and we have invest heavily into developing rapid diagnostic testing. But most importantly, we have really come together the Gladstone community and have shared our collective expertise in the different organ systems that we have here, the brain, the, the heart, um, the lung and, and others um, in order to advance this, um, this research um, program. And uh, because of this, we can now actually see and work with the virus in, for example, lung cells, gut cells, or heart cells here, where in green, you can see little dots in the individual cells that really represent um, the, the little factories that the virus is establishing in the cell to churn out um, new virus R viral RNA and eventually new virions. And this is here shown in green in both the lung and the gut or in orange here in the heart cells, and you can see that the heart cells are actually quite sick when they're replicating the virus. Now this uh, enables us now really to go deeper and look for ways to, inter to interfere with the viral infection and to actually develop new treatments. Um, and based on this uh, beautiful map that has been um, developed in collaboration with UCSF, Gladstone, and basically the whole world, um, we can um, now interrogate how these individual host proteins that interact with the viral proteins, how we can target them with uh, drugs. And there's actually 70 um, uh, factors in that map where existing drugs are, where, uh, uh, where drugs are existing and which we are, can now test whether they actually disrupt um, viral replication and do any good in, in, in COVID patients. So although the virus has been called a piece of bad news wrapped in protein, I think the protein might um, really lead us to um, the right um, proteins in the, in the host cell that we can then use for, for therapeutics. But proteins uh, that are wrapping the virus are also being used in therapeutic in, in uh, diagnostics. Um, we have so-called antigen testing that directly um, goes after detection of these viral um, proteins in, um, in samples. We know that most of our testing is based on PCR where we go after the viral RNA, but we also have now capabilities to actually test the antibodies or the immune response um, that, um, that, that tells us if somebody has had SARS-CoV-2 infection in the past. And we at Gladstone have tested different compared different antibody testings, and we have also developed new rapid diagnostics uh, going after the viral RNA. Um, we all know that um, in order for the tests to be most efficient, they have to be frequent, fast, and they have to be everywhere. Um, the newest modeling from Harvard has really showed if we would be testing daily or every three days, we would have basically no infections because we could uh, isolate immediately all um, new infections and um, through contact tracing, um, you know, basically eliminate or, or cut the spread. Uh, but this only works if we don't wait four days or two days for our test results. This only works if we get the test results immediately. And that's why we have invested here at Gladstone into a, into a test that would go within minutes from, um, you, uh, from the RNA, from the virus and a nasal swab, we are CRISPR reaction to the detection on a, on a smartphone camera that then can analyze the data, but can also upload them into the cloud and, and help with contact tracing. 
So while all this is currently under very intense in, in investigation and, 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 and is making amazing progress, I think we are not yet there. We don't have the vaccine. We don't have the, 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 the active uh, therapeutics and we don't have the rapid testing in place that we wish. So in order to, um, in order to really avoid an Armageddon for this um, holiday season, I think our message is that we should try to stay home and should postpone all of our exotic travel or um, family gatherings to next year when all of these new developments have come online and can um, you know, help us safely gather together again. So with this, I thank you and I think we can move over to the um, discussion part. Thanks, uh, Melanie and Warner. Um, ahead of uh, this event, we had asked um, people that registered if they had questions that they wanted to enter. So if it's all right, I'd like to read a couple of those um, questions now. Um, do we have any idea yet on how long immunity from an mRNA vaccine will last? Melanie, you want to take that? Well, I think this is the million dollar question that everybody is asking. Um, I think we don't have any um, firm ideas about how long this will last. Um, it will, I think it's a very robust re response. We know from, uh, from other vaccines and we know also from the natural infection that, um, that the immunity um, will last. Also, we might not detect it immediately or long-term in the antibody response. Um, but the question, uh, so the, 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 the short answer is no, we don't know, but I think there's hope that it will last at least long enough so that we can with meaningful boosts um, come to a, um, to a long lasting immunity. Great, and I'm gonna uh, ask another question that came from the panelists, one I'm sure is on the minds of many on the call which is if I have my two adult children over for Christmas, what will we have to do to be safe? <clears throat> well, be outdoors as much as possible, which I guess is feasible here in California. If you're indoors, uh, I think you should be masked. Um, and I think eating, you should try and eat as much as possible outdoors in the, in the fresh air. Um, this, is a, this is a tough time, as I was indicating with the statistics, even though we're blessed with fairly with low infection rates here in the Bay Area, it's increasing. There's no question there's a lot more virus uh, um, around us now in the Bay Area. And so now's not the time to let down your guard. Now's the time to try and fight your way into January, February, when the vaccine will become available and we can get beyond this. Just do not let down your guard now, uh, even, even if it's Christmas. Sorry to be the Grinch. Yeah, I might add that testing can, of course, help. But I want to say that, um, you know, because we don't have a testing where we can test every day, I think one negative test result for a two-week period is not going to indicate that it's safe to gather indoors and take your masks off and, and, um, and, and be very close. I think you really have to um, make sure that you and um, that you are aware that uh, testing can reduce your risk, uh, but it cannot eliminate your risk of um, of getting infected. Thanks, uh, Melanie and Warner. And Warner, we'd never consider you a Grinch. Just you're just delivering reality. <laughs> um, similar to the previous question. Um, pre-visit quarantine and testing recommendations when older relatives will visit and you can't stop them from visiting? Similar, similar recommendations as we just mentioned. I don't know, Warner, if you want to go more into detail. Well, now you're talking about people who are at, by virtue of their age, at even higher risk. So I think even greater precautions. I mean, they, frankly, they shouldn't be visiting. But we just got to we just got to get through this holiday season, and um, and so it's going to be hard. It's going to be sad, um, but we're all getting better with Zoom. Great. Um, and another question: um, Are there any statistics on the reinfection rate during the second wave? 
what is the prevailing wisdom or theory as to why they are uh, contracting it again, the virus a second time that is, I believe. Melanie, would you like? Yeah, I think, I, I, I think reinfections are rare. I think we should at least confirm reinfections. I think we're coming now in a stage where we can potentially more meaningfully investigate them because it's just simply a longer time between initial infections or people infected end of last year um, and now, which is about a year period, which is a period that other coronaviruses have confirmed um, conferred um, immunity. Um, so I think it's a, it's a time where we're carefully watching for these reinfections. They have to be very carefully confirmed because uh, to really make sure that it is a reinfection with a different virus and not just a detection of RNA that is lingering in the, in the, in the person um, for, for quite a while um, without potentially being infectious. So I think the, the reinfections is something that everybody is watching very carefully. Um, and we might get more meaningful data now that time, longer time has passed, um, because it's also going to be very important um, for the assessment of the vaccine. Uh, but I think it has to be combined with very careful um, sequencing data um, to make sure that we really know that what we're dealing with is a reinfection. I think low infection reinfection rates is the single best indicator that a vaccine will work. And we are, this uh, reinfection rates with this virus are very, very low, uh, which gives hope uh, that these vaccines will be highly effective. And so far it looks, but again, we don't know about the durability of the response. Right, and uh, Warner and Melanie, a few questions have come in through the Q&A um, beyond the ones that came in before. Um, so if you'd like to turn your attention to the Q&A, that would be great. Yeah. Okay. So the first question is, while the Arizona dosing error was presented in the popular press as a happy mistake, it actually concerned me. How common are major dosing, dosage errors like this? I'm not... Uh I can maybe say something about it. I think it was a happy mistake because they um, they gave the half dose, um, and is, I think in the first round of the, um, and this was not, I didn't know this either, but this was a happy mistake. Um, and it was a happy mistake because it actually was the part, the, 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 the arm of the, of, the, um, of the vaccination that um, that gave the best numbers in terms of protection. So it is the, the, the more successful um, um, strategy. And it has probably to do with the adenoviral uh, immunity that is being elicited just against the vector and not, uh, and not against um, the, the SARS-CoV-2 protein that we want. Um, so I think the happy mistake was good because they gave by mistake the half dose, but the half dose is better um, than the full dose in the, in the full analysis. Um, I, I, I mean, happy mistakes can happen. Um, it's rare that they happen at a, at a, at a large scale in a, in a clinical trial like this. Um, but in this case, it was a, a good outcome because it gives us a good indication of how that, var how that vaccine can be better and uh, more efficient than, uh, than 70%. I apologize. When I see AZ being from Arizona, I think of that <laughs> AstraZeneca, sorry. Yeah, the FDA will not approve that vaccine with half, half dose, full dose, uh, based on the subset of people. Um, they will ha they'll have to go back and, and prove that in a more rigorous uh, manner. And I think that may be one reason that they're looking at combining their vaccine with uh, the Russian vaccine. So are you going to read these? Um, so there was something about Tempest 2 and viral entry. Yes, Tempest 2 is, um, seems to be very um, important in, in the entry because it processes the spike protein, the, the, the glycoprotein in a very important way. Um, it, um, it, 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 it appears that it's not the only one. We know that Tempest 4, for example, can also work in this manner. Um, and, um, and so I think um, there will be a lot more research being dedicated to um, um, to these um, to these molecules, 
and, um, and to this entry step to better understand it. But it, it is clear that um, some inhibitors of TEMPRIS-2 um, have been shown efficacy, at least in vitro, and I'm sure that this will be further explored and potentially expanded to others. Camostat is one drug that has been shown as a TEMPRIS-2 inhibitor, but it's not very effective. Um, yeah, and the one unique part of this virus is it has a what's called another protease cleavage site called a furin cleavage site, which is really distinguishes this virus from the other SARS uh, viruses. And um, the so there's a there's a series of proteases that act upon the spike protein to get it ready to go to do the fusion once it's inside the cell. So those are those are potential uh, good therapeutic targets. There's a question of people with allergies to other vaccines and whether they can receive the mRNA vaccine. An unfortunate development uh, in Britain uh, where two people who are kind of hyper -al uh, allergic, carry EpiPens, have multiple allergies, have immediate hypersensitivity reactions requiring epinephrine, um, that they had reactions to this vaccine. Now, they were not really seen uh, in, the, in the large clinical uh, trial, phase three clinical trial, but uh, I think that's, you know, you're going to see lots of things in the, uh, in the field that you don't see in the, in the rigorous phase three uh, trial. So the FDA is commenting about uh, people, uh, they will likely comment in their approval uh, about people who have our uh, high level allergies. Once the vaccine is available to the public and the virus starts diminishing, what will be the most valuable results Gladstone can offer to the world as a result of its research? Will research, will Gladstone's research still matter? I think it will. Um, <laughs> um, I think it will it will matter in, 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 in SARS-CoV-2, but it will also matter for the next pandemic that we hope to tackle in a, in a more coordinated and better prepared way. Um, so I think much of our research is not only focused on, um, on this virus, but also on the next. Uh, but I also want to um, sort of say a word of caution um, about the vaccine and how the virus will diminish. It will um, hopefully diminish, but it is not yet clear whether the vaccine um, will completely sterilize infection in the way that, it, um, that people will not um, you know, get infected anymore asymptomatically because we have no indication currently from the current trial whether the virus is um, still spreading or not despite the vaccine. We know that people do not get sick and have symptoms. And once they get symptoms, they get tested, but not everybody got tested. Um, so I think there will be a lot more work be done um, to understand how the vaccine works, how the virus will respond to this vaccine in terms of potentially mutating and, um, and, um, and, and trying to escape um, and, um, and how sterilizing or protective that vaccine will be for infections. We have very good indication that it protects from severe disease um, or symptoms, but, uh, but we don't know how well it performed in, in suppressing the circulation of the virus in, in total. So, then about children, Warner, the, the, whether the vaccine will be available to children and what will be the minimum age um, for getting the vaccine. I mean, listen to the FDA advisory committee yesterday. One of the real issues that they brought up uh, was the limited amount of data for 16 to 18 year olds, uh, which had been added on into the Pfizer uh, trial toward, toward the end. Now, there are no studies yet of, you know, really young kids. Um, and so, but the, the FDA advisory committee did approve the emergency use authorization for 16 and, and above um, uh, aged uh, uh, individuals. So I think we'll see now um, more studies in terms of vaccination for children. Of course, in general, children do not suffer greatly with this virus, um, although there certainly are some many tragic examples of, of where that's not true. Um, so I think you, we're going to see more pediatric trials uh, going forward. Yes, there's a, there's a question about uh, when the Rovia detection method will be ready and what needs to happen in order, no, it got away, in order to uh, be ready uh, to use publicly. 
Um, so we're working very actively on a prototype currently um, and, um, and also exploring um, all the possibilities, how we can get this device out into the public um, the fastest. Um, and, um, and, but, uh, but it will take, um, you know, at least several months until it will be, um, you know, manufactured and ready for a first rollout. But we're working very hard on trying to um, shorten this time frame. So I think it will be meaningful for, you know, monitoring virus during, you know, in vaccinated, um, you know, in the vaccinated population. Um, but uh, but it might also be something that we um, we keep our eyes on to adapt to a next virus or, or combine with other viruses like influenza to make sure that we have a full respiratory diagnostic panel that we can apply in one shot if somebody develops symptoms. We have a question here about a poll, research poll of a day ago indicated that 60% of American adults said they would definitely, 29% or probably 31%, take the uh, vaccine. 18% said, said they definitely would not, and 21% said they would probably not. How does this affect herd immunity? This is a big, big issue. If we have a highly effective vaccine, it's not effective until people are vaccinated. And we really need to reach somewhere between 70 and 80% uh, successful vaccination to establish this, this concept of herd immunity, uh, where in fact the virus will, because it cannot fi easily find hosts to grow in, that it will gradually, gradually uh, extinguish itself from our population. So um, we have to take every step possible in terms of education, um, uh, encouragement, uh, every, uh, we need to be involved in a huge media campaign, a huge information campaign uh, to ensure that people take advantage of, uh, of these vaccines. Um, to do otherwise, we're going to be living in this hell for a lot longer. Yes, there's a question on being contagious even after vaccination. Uh, I think that speaks really to the point that uh, um, that we don't know yet how um, well we control the, um, the infection after vaccination. Uh, but I, um, I think uh, it, um, research in, 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 in COVID patients um, has shown that um, as soon as uh, neutralizing antibodies are being developed, um, the virus is, becomes not any more contagious also, uh, or infectious, also it is still present. Um, so I think there will be interesting studies being done currently about whether you can get infected and whether you can then produce enough particles to, um, to be contagious uh, once you are vaccinated. All these things will, be, will have to be investigated thoroughly. Warner and Melanie, there's a question here that asks um, if you could discuss Gladstone's efforts in the area of therapeutics. I could just say a word that uh, we're doing two things uh, in the therapeutic area. One, as Melanie mentioned earlier, we're trying to develop uh, fusion inhibitors, things that block the entry of this virus into cells, but not only this virus, it would be fusion inhibitors that would be active against all coronaviruses because this is a highly conserved pathway. So if we ever see SARS-3, SARS-4, uh, we would, you know, these inhibitors that we are crea creating and, and, and perfecting would be effective in that situation as well. And, and in studies with Katerina Akasoglu's lab, uh, we're really trying to delve into the heart of the pathogenesis of this virus, which is clotting. The formation of these clots in small vessels, which damages the endothelial, damages the lung, sets up huge inflammation. And we are making really good progress in terms of understanding that process and now think that we have a blueprint for being able to interrupt the clotting process. Um, so I'm really excited about, uh, about those uh, types of approaches. Yeah, I can say maybe in general, I think there's two types of approaches. One is the, the repurposing of um, you know, approved drugs that you could dispatch very fast into the current pandemic because you don't need any additional clinical trials. Um, there's a lot of work going on um, in that direction, um, especially also in Nevin's lab.
but uh, but there is um, there is also a you know now that we know a lot more molecular pathways that are being um, affected and and know the players that are being involved. There is also um, a lot of drug uh, new drug to, uh, development going on, um, which might be um, you know more effective than just repurposing existing existing drugs. So I think this will take longer. Um, but it might uh, lead eventually to um, to um, more um, you know more potent therapeutics. Um, at the same time, um, we're also collaborating with um, you know with um, you know drug companies, Gilead and others, um, to test their their treatments. Um, and in general, I would say that um, one of our one of our approaches was in the past that we always thought it would be important to have something that, that hits more than one virus. Warner has alluded to this, a pan-coronavirus treatment or um, even more broader, um, maybe a pan-RNA virus treatment um, that we could envision. So by, by systematically comparing different responses of different viruses and developing something against um, you know, um, a, a target that is common to all of them will help us a lot to um, to be prepared for the next pandemic. And that's um, much of the effort that's going on in the Institute. We have a question. What is it about the RNA vaccine technology that we believe it's safe after only three to six months of trial follow-up? Why are we not worried about unintended long-term consequences like happened with thalidomide and focamelia? Uh, it's a very good question. The long-term toxicity of these uh, vaccines uh, is the, the point. Uh, this is an emergency use authorization. Uh, there are safety data through two months, which looks good. And most toxicities with vaccines do show up within that two month period of time. But in general, to register this vaccine, to have it totally fully approved, uh, will require six months of safety data, which will, I think, take uh, probably will be in February or March before Pfizer uh, seeks that type of, a, of approval. But this vaccine, the RNA vaccine, it's, it really is a very simple vaccine. There is a, a lipid shell that allows the delivery of the vaccine into the cell and, and inside is an RNA. And the RNA simply jumps onto the ribosomes and is translated into the coronavirus spike protein, which is then put on the membrane and then an, we mount an immune response to that protein. Um, the RNA goes away. Uh, the, the lipid bilayer goes away. So it's not like there's any uh, significant remnant. Now we are training the immune system on the spike protein, but that's exactly, that's exactly why we're getting uh, protection. So in many ways, in contrast to, uh, to, to other vaccines, DNA vectors, uh, killed vaccines, attenuated live viruses, these are uh, uh, really a fairly safe platform to begin with. Yes, I think there's also a question here more specific about mixing Moderna and Pfizer uh, vaccines, for example, and also, um, and also will the vaccine protect us from other illnesses such as flu? Um, I know we know that the flu vaccine has a slight influence on, um, on, on the severity of SARS-CoV-2. So there is a small protection based on the innate, just the innate immune response that is elicited by the vaccine. Um, so while the vaccine is not going to be specific to protecting us from flu, um, vaccination might have a general effect in, in, in making our, um, our um, immune system stronger. Uh, to deal also with other viruses. Um, and I think there's currently no plans on mixing the Pfizer and the, the Moderna uh, vaccines. I think there's different rollouts of uh, the two vaccines. One is, uh, I think, um, distributed by the states and the other one, uh, Moderna, is distributed by the military and the VA hospitals currently. Um, so there will be different, um, uh, different populations targeted um, for the different vaccines. Um, I find the, the question interesting how we will deal with the adenoviral um, vaccines. It's currently only a single dose, but in case we need a booster, I think we will have to switch the vector or change the, 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 the vaccine for the boost. So there will be definitely um, research necessary in the future on, on finding out how um, these regimens at the end can be achieved in the best possible manner. By, by combining potentially technologies. 
but I don't think that there's any plans or any um, legal ground for doing this currently. There is an interesting, uh, while the Pfizer and Moderna RNA vaccines are equal uh, in terms of their, apparently equal in terms of their uh, efficacy, uh, there is a slightly, about a twofold higher side effect uh, reported with the Moderna vaccine uh, compared to Pfizer in terms of fatigue. Um, uh, fever was the same, but fatigue and uh, muscle pain, I believe, were the, were the two symptoms that were somewhat higher in the uh, uh, Moderna vaccine. Whether that relates to the, the lipid shell and the way that it's being delivered um, or a, a greater RNA response, we don't know, but there is a slight difference. Will we mandate employees to get vaccinated for COVID, Warner? Well, that was a question that came up yesterday, uh, and I think that while we did do that for influenza, because that was a certified vaccine and we wanted to try and protect the hospitals as much as possible, uh, and there was the, side, the slight benefit of COVID protection, the, the, I don't think that we, under the context of an emergency use authorization, um, that we can, it's my opinion that we should not insist but we should strongly encourage our employees to get uh, vaccinated. But I don't think that we can uh, insist that that's a, uh, a factor that can determine whether they can come to work or not. We can maybe quickly discuss the schools and why there are lower rates um, than expected and, um, and why children seem to be protected, especially the younger ones. And we really want to give a shout out here also to Katie Pollard, our, our colleague who has done a lot of work here with the local um, school district um, to address exactly that question, how, how uh, much transmission is really happening in the schools and, and, and which children are are highest at risk. Um, and I think we have a partial opening of some of the schools now in the, uh, in the county and in the area. And I think this will help us better understand it. But, but, but my understanding is that specifically in the younger kids, the transmission is, um, is very low. Um, I think when it comes to high school kids, which is um, the kids that are my age range is currently, I think there's no protection and I need to remind my kids every day to make sure that they, uh, they understand that, um, that they have the same risk as adults or even higher based on, on behavior. Um, but, uh, but it might, might have to do with the, um, with the cross reactivity of other coronaviruses, the common cold coronaviruses that might help the younger kids to deal better with infections or to avoid infections. But I think this is still um, out there, the question um, why the children are, be, are doing better um, during this um, pandemic. So we have a question, is the evidence about, is there any evidence about whether the vaccines are safe for pregnant women? Um, there were women who became pregnant in the Pfizer trial, uh, that they were in the midst of, and then, uh, of a vaccine trial and became pregnant. So there is a limited data set in terms, and there appeared to be no, uh, there were no reportable uh, problems, but the number is quite small. So I think that we don't, the answer is we don't really know, uh, but there have been some pregnant women who have received the vaccine without problems. And they haven't had their babies yet, my wife points out. <laughs> She was the labor and delivery nurse. She kind of understands that stuff. <laughs> so should we worry about the virus evolving to escape the spike protein-based vaccine and the vaccines about other antigens being developed? Um, I think that's a very valid question and, um, and needs to be addressed. And there are other um, um, approaches. Warner, I don't know if you want to go into more detail here um, where it's not only spike protein-based. Right, that there are there are broader arrays of, of proteins in different vaccine platforms that will be, for example, an attenuated form of the virus or a killed form of the virus, will be vaccinating with a whole slew of different antigens. Um, now, this this virus it has a proofreading enzyme, uh, which and so it's unlike most RNA viruses that you know really vary greatly that they mutate they they they're, they're it's a swarm of different variants. 
this virus has maintains a pretty constant uh, uh, RNA genome uh, due to its proofreading enzyme. Not to say that there haven't been some very notable mutations that have occurred in the spike protein, et cetera. And there is now a mutation identified in mink in, in Denmark that that mutation affects the ability of the neutralizing antibodies that, uh, that, uh, you know, that we're all so excited about, like the Eli Lilly and like the vaccine-induced neutralizing antibodies, that type of mutation might compromise the ability of those antibodies to work. So we have to be ever alert that we might have to re-engineer uh, and, and refine the vaccine, kind of like the, the flu vaccine is refined on an on a annual basis, but hopefully we're not gonna have to do it as frequently as every year. Now, here's an important question. What can I do to support Gladstone research at this time? Are there equipments or other needs, PPE? Thank you. Um, yes, thank you for this question. Um, I think there's many ways to um, support Gladstone research um, now and, and in the future. Um, I think uh, we have um, needs. I, I can maybe also say a, a few words about the PPE. As soon as we went into the second wave, um, I think uh, PPE became in, enormously scarce again. Um, and that affects us directly, not only in our regulatory, in the regular laboratories, but in our BSL-3 laboratory. Um, and it's very hard for us to, um, to get um, all the equipment and, um, and maintain the 24 seven usage of the room basically, which is what, we, what we're currently doing. So there's many ways you can support us. There's a donate button on the website, but there's also, you can also get in touch with any of us, um, maybe our communications teams um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and evaluate what, what would be a best way forward here. I would just add to that, that, you know, we have all, we have uh, all of the investigators at Gladstone have a number of NIH grants to do the things that they were studying before COVID-19. And that philanthropy has really played a key role in terms of seed funding to launch so many COVID-19 projects because you, you have to retool, you can't use the money for the, for the, from your prior grants except to pay salaries. Uh, and so you have to, the, the, the philanthropy has been absolutely key to get the research up and going on, off the ground. Yes. And a shout out to our philanthropy team, which was great. And um, Warner, there was a very initial question about why can we make a fast coronavirus vaccine, but not an HIV vaccine? Mm -hmm. I yes. thought we cannot let that pass, no? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, again, it's because the coronavirus is pretty constant. Its spike protein is right there, right in front of us, and we can use it as an antigen, and we can make a neutralizing antibody. And, but the real big difference is, is that HIV worms its way into our DNA. Uh, and these coronaviruses uh, and these most RNA, all the, all the RNA viruses um, stay out of our DNA. So there is not this permanence, there's not this high mutability, this, this amazing ability to, uh, as soon as you apply an immunologic or drug pressure, the virus changes and mutates away. It's constantly in motion. So fortunately, the coronaviruses are not like that. They're, they are a relatively straightforward vaccine target. And what you have seen is the development of vaccines that would normally take years to be done in months. It's, it's frankly uh, a triumph of science. All right. How likely will we see viruses like COVID moving forward? Um, I think very likely, unfortunately. Um, and um, I think we have had many close hits in the past. Uh, we have had on average um, an outbreak, a significant outbreak every five years. We had SARS, SARS MERS, we had Zika. Uh, we have, you know, repeated scares with Ebola, which has not really, um, you know, spread worldwide. Um, but I think there are, you know, constantly viruses on the horizon. And I think this one really um, got into, you know, global circulation and, um, and did what it did to basically, uh, shutting down the global economy. Um, so I think, um, you know, coronaviruses are around and they are likely to reemerge again, given our history with SARS, MERS and, and COVID. And, um, and I think, but there's other viruses that we have to watch out for. And that's why 
these preparedness and pan-viral approaches that are currently being discussed, in my mind, are really very important. But I also have to say that I think a lot of the infrastructure and the, the enormous um, way how the research and, um, and um, commercial side has come together to develop something and to establish something, I think will set precedent for the next pandemic um, in which we can hopefully use all this to, to react much faster than, um, than we did now. So we have a question. My relatives have heard in the popular media about the potential off-the-shelf therapeutic like ivermectin. Is there any scientifically validated merit to these claims? So ivermectin is a drug uh, that is used to treat river blindness, uh, a parasitic infection in the eye. Um, ivermectin does have antiviral activity against the coronavirus. Unfortunately, it is at doses that are toxic for the cell. So um, the so that it's really not going to emerge as an antiviral activity, even though there was initial early interest, but it, it, the, the, the doses required are just too high. Any comment on the possibility that remdesivir will be made more widely available? I think it's really an important point. I think uh, remdesivir is an interesting drug, obviously developed based on um, initial drug development in Ebola. Um, but it has excellent activity in, in, in our cell culture and BSL-3 experiments on viral replication. Um, it is, however, injectable, so it needs to be injected, um, and, um, and that makes it um, pretty much only accessible for patients when they are hospitalized and in, in, in later stages when the disease might not be dependent on the viral replication per se, but might have been moved into a um, a response to the uh, into an immune response um, disease, basically. So I think remdesivir needs to be, um, you know, evaluated very carefully um, because um, it might have its best uh, efficacy at the at the early stages, and for that stage, they need it needs to be better applicable. Um, and um, you know, the most um, interesting one would be intranasally, and I think that's something that uh, is currently heavily investigated. And the WHO has taken remdesivir off their list as an effective drug, but it's being used at a time when the cow's already out of the barn, as Melanie was pointing out. Someone asked about taking a flu and, a, and COVID vaccine simultaneously. Would that be, would that be advised against? Uh, you should go and get your flu vaccine now mm -hmm. and then get your COVID vaccine when it becomes available. Um, I don't know, I don't think there are in, uh, I, I've not heard of any guidance in terms of simultaneously vaccinating for COVID and, and flu, but there's no reason. Get your flu vaccine now. This would be the best time. Yeah, there's some question about te te technical issues. How will we know that people have been vaccinated? Are they getting a card? Will that be proof of vaccination? Um, you know, will that be required to leave the country or to go into other countries? All this will be have to be worked out in my mind. I don't know if there's concrete plans, but it's definitely um, 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 something that is currently very actively being discussed, um, whether you will have a card like this and uh, uh, I know from, from, from other countries like China, um, where this has already been established based on testing um, to give you the green or the red light, basically, for getting into a building um, or not being in contact with anybody who is contagious. So um, I have no idea what is uh, planned here in the United States, but, uh, but I think that, uh, um, that um, it's possible that we will go down that route. So there's a question here, for those who have contracted the virus and recovered, if they travel, can they be re-exposed, can they be exposed and then carry the virus to those that have not been infected? So presumably for a period of time after natural infection, you have mounted antibody responses, T cell responses, et cetera, that have neutralized the virus. So presumably if you're exposed to the virus again, while your immune system is on the ready, um, uh, you will not be able to carry and propagate the virus and therefore transmit it to other people. Um, we don't know precisely how long that immunity lasts though. And it seems to vary depending upon whether you had a very mild form of infection initially or a very serious form of infection to begin with. So um, 
I think that in these times, I think that, um, you know, everybody should be wearing a mask, whether, you know, having had the disease is not an excuse not to be uh, taking the appropriate uh, uh, precautions. Um, and for example, you don't know whether your immunity has waned sufficiently that you might become infected, wear a mask. Until we get really a good vaccine on board, wear a mask. I think this is coming to the top of the hour now. Um, I don't know, Megan, you want to wrap up or you want to continue? I'm happy to. Um, I just want to thank uh, everyone for participating today. Maybe we'll take one more question before um, we sign off and we're happy to collect the rest of the questions that weren't answered um, and get answers to those um, out to attendees. Um, so feel free um, also to email us with, with any questions. Um, Megan, this question Megan yes. you also reminded me of something that I was supposed to say and I think I didn't say it. So yes. you say it yourself. Yes, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy to. Um, after we take this just last question, Mel, then we'll go ahead and wrap. Um, well, there's a question here about I wear a mask every time I go out. I rarely leave the house and I still get a cold every now and then. Am I not being careful enough or are cold viruses even more prevalent and contagious than SARS-CoV-2? That's a really good <laughs> question. I've asked myself that question. <laughs> I mean, I... Uh, First thing is, are you sure you're not having allergies? Uh, because they can have many of the same uh, types of symptoms. Um, the, uh, you know, I, it's, a, it's an interesting, I mean, masking is not a 100% foolproof protection. It can reduce your acquisition of, of SARS-CoV-2, which is primarily spread by large respiratory droplets, but somewhat by aerosols. Um, and so physical distancing protects you from the respiratory droplets, but not from the aerosols. So that's why it's really important to wear a mask, even if you're physically uh, distanced. Um, you know, I, you know I, I can't really explain why you would be getting uh, colds, um, but if you are having frequent colds, then I think you ought to re rethink what mask you're wearing <laughs> and maybe uh, double down in terms of a better mask. Well, thank you so much, Warner. Go ahead, Warner. I just did want to say that masking in Brazil squashed the influenza season. I think we're doing good with all our distancing and our masking. There might be still some, you know, occasional infection breaking through, but in general, I think we have uh, we yeah. have put a lid on it quite effectively. So it's a it's a good strategy for the future, also. Well, thank you so much, Warner and Melanie, for this time. Um, it's great that um, you are available to answer our questions because there is a, a lot of misinformation out in the media. It's hard to sort what's real and what's not real. But I think what I'm hearing is the basic message for this holiday season is um, stay home if you can, uh, although hard, um, maybe postpone plans this year and wait till next year when there's a vaccine um, and wear your mask best you can. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, we, of course, wish everyone a happy holiday season. Please be, be safe, um, keep your family safe. And uh, we'll get this group together again um, in the new years as we track progress with the vaccine and others. So thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.